In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So like we mentioned earlier um, in the liturgy, the point of this meeting is to help facilitate newcomers to come to the church and a place where we can invite them to come. And God willing, like the, the people can grow and increase. And it'll be a place where people can, one, get to know others and also learn uh, about our faith and, and so on. So I wanted to talk today about, since we're kind of kicking off the meeting, I wanted to, to talk about the vision of the church. What is the vision of a church? What is it that we should be doing as a church? What is a church? Why did God create a church to be, and, and what should it look like? In Matthew 12, 22, it says, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Sometimes we, we, we look at the function of a church in a very one-dimensional way. We look at it as, okay, well, people are going to come and they're going to take communion. And yes, that's the most important part. But how are you going to get them from the place of, I don't attend church at all and I don't know anything about the faith, the faith to now I'm coming every week and I'm taking communion? There's a lot that has to happen from you to go from one extreme to the other. And sometimes when we you know, focus a lot on like, you know, teaching about the Bible and things like that. Well, that's great. But there's sometimes issues in people's lives that prevents them from learning about the Bible and prevents them from, from even being able to come to church. Okay. And so that also has to be in our mind when we're taking what is the church? Actually, if you look at what Christ did, so much of his time was spent healing people, right? Healing people is not a spiritual activity. He was healing their bodies or he was feeding them, right? Why was he doing that? He was doing that because that was the first step for the next thing, which was the more important, which was the spiritual nourishment. But you can't give people spiritual nourishment when they're lacking so much already that they, they don't even want to come to the church or they don't even understand what the church is about or what we're offering. So, so that's going to keep that in your mind because that's going to be all tied into the idea of what is the function of a church. Okay, so when we try to understand the church and who is it the church serves, Sometimes we're very, again, narrow in our view of who is it that the church serves. The church serves the members. Okay, well, yes, the church serves the members. But who else does the church serve? The church actually serves the entire world. The church serves everybody in, th in the world, whether they be active members or whether they be non-active members, meaning people that have come to the church and are part of the church but have left, people that maybe we all know people that used to be regular in the church that don't come anymore. And this group of people, we tend to serve them less. You know, the active members, we tend to serve the most because they're the people that come, they're, they're physically present, we see them, we remember them, we know them by name, and they're involved in things, and they come to activities and Bible studies, and they come every week, and so on. And so, because we know them, we tend to gear most of our services toward those people, okay? The non-active members, they're people that, yes, we remember them, maybe, or at least a subset of the congregation remembers them. Friends that we had that have stopped coming to church long ago, and there's always a reason why. There's always a reason. Why is it that they stopped coming? The third group, which I would say is the group we serve the least, is the unbelievers. These are people that we've never met. We don't know who they are at all, and they're people that are out there somewhere, right? But if you look at the ministry of Christ, Christ served all of these people. He served the people who are active Jews, who were in the synagogue, who were praying and worshiping. He actually would go to the synagogue and he would give sermons. Well, who is he giving the sermon to? He's giving the sermon to the active members, the people who are already active in their Judaism, in their faith. He also went to those who were non-active, okay? Maybe people who were Jews but had left, didn't, didn't attend the synagogue, didn't attend the worship services, didn't uh, offer sacrifices. He was still cognizant of them. He was still serving them. And then the third group is unbelievers, you know, whether it could be a Gentile, or another person. He cared about all these people, okay? And that's why it's important for us to remember what is it that God wants the church to do? God wants the church to serve all these people. God doesn't want us to just serve one of these three groups alone. He wants us to serve all three. And not only to serve all three, but he wants us to serve all three equally. He wants us to serve all three equally. When you look at St. Paul's ministry, St. Paul's ministry, he spent almost all of his time on the number three group, on the group of people that maybe we today spend the least time on. If, if St. Paul hadn't spent most of his time on the unbelievers, then he wouldn't have been able to preach and to expand the Christian church for you know, so quickly and so fast and so much as he did because he would be thinking in his mind, you know what, I'm just going to focus on the Jews. I'm just going to focus on the Jews. I'm just going to serve the Jews. Okay? And sometimes we get into this mindset. I'm just going to serve the Copts. 
All I'm going to do is serve the cops because there's a lot of cops and you know, we can barely keep up with the number of cops there are and all the services that exist for the cops. So we're going to need more services for cops, more services for cops, more and more. And then finally we realize, well, we're already so swamped with services for people who are already in the church that we really don't try to expand the church. We don't grow the church. And most of all, we don't satisfy the function of the church completely. We only do so partially. We do so because, yes, we are successfully serving the people who are here, but we're not trying to grow the people that are here and especially not just grow them from our own people but to grow them from those who are outside to grow for those people who are 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 away from god those people that maybe we've never met before and so again we have to keep this in our mind so i'm going to go through each of these three okay groups the church serves everyone in the world we serve the active members we serve the non-active members and we serve the unbelievers so the first group is the active members each of these three groups, there's two ways that we serve them. There's two ways that we serve the active, there's two ways that we serve the non-active, and there's two ways that we serve the unbeliever. So first, the active. What is the ways we serve the active? The first is we nourish those people who are active members because they are already members in the church. They need nourishment, right? They need to be filled continually with the Word of God. We need to have spiritual meetings, prayer meetings, you know, fellowship, education, all kinds of things that we traditionally see and find in the church and we're very good at this one we're very good because we have all kinds of services and we continue to try to grow these services because we see who are the people in the church what are their needs we have you know services for young children we have services for young adults we have services for seniors we have services you know for married couples we have services for for many different things maybe we don't have all those here yet but but in general in the Coptic Church we have okay um, so this is important because when someone comes to the church, we have to give them the nourishment that they need. This is what the church is supposed to do. The other aspect of the service to the active members is that we have to keep them, right? Meaning we have to understand their needs and we have to not put a burden on them beyond what they are able to bear. And we have to be practical so that their needs are actually met. We want someone to, when they come into the church, they feel this church meets my needs. It meets my spiritual needs. It meets my fellowship needs. It meets all the needs that I have. And so I enjoy being here. I don't have to be pulled, dragged, and you know, upset when I come to church or when I wake up on Sunday or when I want to go to a Bible study. I want to go. I want to go because every time I go, I feel like the services is directed toward me. Okay? I feel a sense of belonging, okay? which is maybe something historically in our church sometimes people who come from the outside and many people I've spoken to who come from the outside do not feel the sense of belonging instead they feel a sense of maybe even sad to say rejection when they look different they sound different they don't already know what we're doing and so a lot of times maybe people in the Egyptian culture have a difficult time dealing with that just as we sometimes have a difficult time dealing with other cultures okay or they have difficult time dealing with us it's very normal, actually, that everybody wants to spend all of their time with people that look like them and talk like them. You know, if you look at the group of friends that you have, it's probably a group of people that look like you and sound like you and, and have the same opinion as you, right? Because that by, by our nature, we like to spend time with those people who are like us. And that's great in our personal life. That's fine. But when it comes to the church, the church is not an arena for personal, you know, for personal development. This is not like a place for me as a person to come and hang out with my buddies that are that look and sound like me. The, the purpose of the church is for the salvation for all people in the world, right? So I can't say even though I personally like to deal with a certain group that I can enforce my personal desire and my personal preferences in the way that the church is, is structured and the way the church functions in the way that I deal with people and the people that I talk to. So it means that even if in my personal life, I naturally gravitate to a certain group of people that I want to spend time with, but in the church, I can't do that. In the church, if I see someone who is different than me, I have to force myself, even if it doesn't come naturally, for me to talk to them. That is my obligation. That's not just up to my personal preference. It's not just saying, well, is this person like me or are they not like me? Do I feel comfortable with this person? I don't. That has nothing to do with it. It is our role as Christians, as members of the church, to reach out to those people who are not like us okay so that's why we try we, and it's difficult I'm not trying to say this comes naturally we have to train ourselves to do this because by our nature we want to spend time with those people who look and talk and act like us so in order to keep the members of the church 
we have to give them the services that they need we have to be practical and we have to make them feel like they belong like they're a member of the church not just in the spiritual sense of we we have the same faith we have the same dogma but we also enjoy being together we choose to spend time together and this is a very important uh, aspect of the church the non-active members the second group that we said, again, are people that used to be active. People that used to come to the church, people that we used to know who they are, but now we don't anymore. Okay, We don't see them anymore. They, they drifted away, they disappeared for whatever reason. And oftentimes, we just naturally forget about these people. You know, These are the people that are on church lists and haven't come for weeks and weeks and months and years. And, and we don't even know how to reach them, or we try to reach them and they don't answer. And so just very gradually, we kind of assume like they're not really part of the church anymore. They're not members of the church. Well, yeah, maybe they're not. Maybe they're not members of the church. But the whole point of the church is that it doesn't only serve the members. It serves everyone, even those people who are not currently attending the church. In Ezekiel 34, verse 4, it says, The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. This is the rebuke that God is giving to the people of Israel. He's telling them, you have not strengthened the weak, right? Maybe the person became a lost sheep because they were weak. Maybe because something happened and they couldn't endure it and they were overwhelmed by it and so they left the church. But he's saying what? The onus is on us. You have not strengthened the weak. It is our role to strengthen the weak, okay? You have not healed those who are sick. And this doesn't necessarily mean a physical healing but those people who are sick in their spirit, those people who are sick emotionally, those people who are frail and fragile and broken, okay, we, have not, we have not healed them. You have not bound up the broken. You have not brought back what was driven away. Sometimes people are driven from the church. Sometimes people say, what is it the reason you don't go to church? Well, it's because this person did this or this person said this. Sometimes the person who leaves the church, they are overly sensitive. Maybe the thing that somebody told them, they really should not have offended them in any way. But even still, if somebody has left the church because of a misunderstanding or whatever the case might be, we still have to go after them. We still have to bring them back. Finally, nor sought what was lost. If somebody is lost, if somebody falls into sin and, 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 and falls away from Christ, we have to, we have to seek uh, after them. So there's two categories. If you read this, this verse here in Ezekiel 34, there's two types of services here. Okay? The one service is searching, and the second service is healing searching and healing what is the searching I'll, I'll say the searching first this the searching is what bringing back those who are driven away and seeking after those who are lost this requires a search right so in order for us to be successful at serving these people there has to be a way for us to search there has to be for a way for us to know who are these people who are these people that have been driven who are these people that are lost because we can't even begin to do the next step which is to heal them when we don't even know who these people are right so that's a big important step like we as members of the church if we know of people that are are lost then we need to make them known we need to say who are these people these are people that used to attend the church but don't you can come talk to one of the servants you can talk to me you can you know talk to one of the greeters anyone who in the church and, and you yourselves i mean you don't just have to report it you go after them you know you go find them but also get the help of the church as a whole because we should all have one purpose and one, one function, which is we're wanting to fulfill the commandment of Christ in, in doing what is it the church should be. And this is part of what the church should be. Bringing back those who are driven away and seeking after those who are lost. That's one part of the verse. The other part of the verse, like I said, is strengthening the weak, healing the sick, and binding up the broken. Meaning once we find these people, I can't just go to them and say, well, let's have a Bible study and then, okay, invite them to the church and we're done. No, because look look again at what Christ did. Christ met their physical needs, okay? Now, in this country, most of the time, the physical needs of people is not material needs. Many, many times. Our, our country is affluent to a large extent, and usually the thing that's preventing people from coming to the church is not that they don't have any money, okay, or they don't have any food. Maybe this is the case in other countries, Some, for instance, a country like Bolivia, where the main need of people is, is poverty. And so you have to give them all kinds of physical services in order for them to 
reach the point where now you can feed them spiritually. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't people like that here, but to a much larger extent, the kind of needs that people have here are emotional and psychological needs, right? Someone feels broken. Someone feels rejected. Someone feels depressed. Someone feels suicidal. All of these things are emotional needs. So if someone who is feeling this way, and then you're coming to give them some lessons about the Bible, a lot of times people aren't going to accept it. They're, gonna, they're, they're, they're too wound up in their own problem to be able to listen to something else. And, and this is why we, in order for us to demonstrate love to them, they don't see this as love. They don't understand this as love. They don't understand their need for salvation. They understand their need for getting over alcoholism. They understand their need for being able to cope being a single parent. Right? That's, what they, that's their immediate need. They're not even have the mind share in order to think about salvation. Okay, no, I'm thinking about how am I going to get through today? So if we provide services for these people, what would it look like? Again, we're saying that this is the function of a church, right? So the function of a church, just as Christ, you know, fed, fed the hungry and he, he touched the lepers, okay? How is it that we would touch the lepers? How is it that we would do this? Is something we have to keep in our mind because this is a function of the church, Right? And this is a function of the church specifically for these, this non-active group. And again, historically, we don't do as good serving this group because maybe it's more difficult for us to think this way, right? Um, historically, in our culture, for instance, it's kind of a taboo to have counseling, okay? People don't want to go to counseling. People think counseling is, is not right, okay? But a lot of people need counseling, okay? whether it be counseling from people who are already in the church, like servants who went through training, or whether it be professional counseling. But imagine if we had some kind of professional counseling and this was a regular thing and, and there wasn't a taboo for people to go talk to them because we all have weaknesses and we all need help sometimes. So this is something, again, for us to keep in mind, okay? So the two, the two ways that we serve the non-active members, again, is searching and healing. For searching, we have to always keep accurate records. We have to know, okay, what is the, what is, who are the people in the church? Having a good database, having a good system to kind of keep track of everybody. Who is it that's attending regularly? Who is it that's not attending? And then reaching out to them, not just knowing who they are, but then reaching out to them, okay? Maintaining some kind of connection, even with those people that do not want to come to church, even with those who we've invited many times and they say no every time, that I still want to make that connection. I still want to make them feel that they're still cared for. And a lot of times this connection can be, you know, social. It doesn't have to be, if they don't want to come to church, it can just be a social thing. I go hang out with them and do whatever. Um, and a lot of times you have people who are in the church who are active members that are still friends with these people that maybe have stopped coming to church. And we can leverage that to help attract them to the church. The second uh, way that we serve this group, like I said, is healing. So we have to understand why is it that they left? You know, why did you leave to begin with? Did you leave because you got too busy? Did you leave because you were offended? Did you leave because you got, you know, wrapped up in your work or in a bad group of people or you moved to another place and didn't have a church there? Wh what is the reason why you left? And we try to address that. Like I said, we could have support groups. Like, you know, for instance, if there is uh, single parents, for instance, there's a lot of single parents in the church, okay? Maybe these people need some kind of support group for them to talk to each other about it. Like I said, Orthodox counseling. And above all, do not judge. We cannot judge people who have not had the perfect ideal life. We cannot judge them, okay? Because we ourselves will be judged by God who have been in the church and have not done what God has commanded and have sinned against him, even though having known everything, right? Maybe God judges the people who have gone through so many difficulties like this better than those who have been in the church all their lives because they didn't have the benefit of being in the church, right? So we have to accept everyone who comes to the church regardless of their background, regardless of their history, regardless of their sins, regardless of anything because the church is a place for redemption. The, the church is a place for restoration of people. The last group that I want to mention is the unbelievers, okay? So we said this is the third group. And, and actually, when you think about it, this is the biggest group. There are more unbelievers than there are believers. And I say that even though technically maybe two-thirds of the world is Christian, um, but that's just on paper. That's, that's not real. People don't actually practice. Two-thirds of the world don't actually practice the Christian religion. Okay? If they did, things would be very different in the world. Okay? 
So what are the two ways that we serve these unbelievers? The first way is we preach, okay, which is an active way of serving, right? We, we, we go and we have services out in the world, okay? It could be campus ministries. It could be community service. It could be speaking at other churches. It could be, and this is the most effective way to bring people to the church, which is called conversational evangelism, where we simply are bold enough to talk about our faith with other people we know in conversation which is actually the simplest and requires the least planning and the least effort of all of the different forms. It also happens to be the most effective, which is simply not to be afraid to talk about what we believe with people we already know, right? I'm not talking about missionary work, right? Missionary work is maybe even a step above this, where it's saying, you know what, I'm so passionate about evangelism that I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to leave everyone and I'm going to go move to a country where I, you know, it's like completely difficult lifestyle and I don't know how I'm going to live and that's missionary work, okay? I'm not even saying we have to do that, right? It, it, simple evangelism is just, I happen to be at work, and I just say, thank God, that maybe someone is going to ask me about my faith, or people see me fasting, or whatever the case might be. It's very simple things, so that we don't feel ashamed or confused or afraid in order for us to do that. But in order for us to do that, we have to understand what we believe, so when people talk to us about it, um, then we, we know. You know, sometimes many people I talk to, they're, they're afraid of talking to people about their faith because they always ask, what if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? Right? Most people, whenever they are interested in something genuinely, they're not going to get so much into the little nitty-gritty de details that you have to be a th theologian in order to answer the question. Okay? They're going to ask maybe basic questions, maybe that we should all know. But in order to help increase confidence and knowledge in the members of the church one thing god willing we plan to do relatively soon is we're going to start what we're calling a membership course it's also going to be a catechism course it's going to be held on saturday uh, afternoons uh, before vespers and it's going to be a class which will last several weeks the point of the class is essentially to give a refresher to everyone who is um, already orthodox what it is that we believe that's number one and two it's also going to serve as a catechism for those people who are coming to the church. I used to meet with catechumens, people who want to be baptized. I used to meet with them one-on-one -on -one, um, for three or four weeks each in order to kind of get them kind of some basic knowledge about the faith, and then they would be baptized after that. But right now, the number of catechumens has increased to the point where, like, right now I have three simultaneously, and so it's starting to take up so much time that I can't, like, I, I have to schedule them so far out because I have every Saturday a meeting with a different person. So I think it's, we're getting close to the time where we can start having a standing catechism class. And the class will be offered once a quarter, okay? And it will last probably around one month. So every three months, there'll be a class that lasts one month. And this will serve both as a catechism class and as a membership course. Because m most people that I tell that I have this class, they themselves want to join even though they're already orthodox. The goal of this is to increase the knowledge and confidence of the existing members of the church so that we understand what we believe and so that we will feel more bold to go and talk about our faith to other people, okay? Again, all of this is related to our faith and to sharing our faith with others. Again, conversational evangelism is the most effective way of bringing people to the church. And God willing, once the harvest meeting here gets more established, we'll start to have days where we're going to encourage everybody to invite their friends and family and whoever to the church on a specific day so we'll be ready for them and hoping that a, a larger group of, of non-orthodox people who are coming to wanting to learn about the church and see what it's about will come and we'll be ready we'll be ready for them the second uh the second way that we serve the unbelievers remember i said the first one was preaching which is the active where i'm actually going and doing like a specific action the second way that we serve the unbelievers is a more passive way, okay? It's a passive way. It's not that I'm going out to preach, but is that I'm preparing the church so that when people come, it's ready for them. So, for instance, one clear example at St. Paul is that everything is in English, right? The fact that everything is in English doesn't, it's not an active, it's not preaching. We're not, we're not going out and preaching that. It's simply that when somebody walks in the door, what do they experience? They experience something accessible, something that they can understand, and that's what we're trying to do. For instance, we have a group of greeters that welcome people when they come in, okay? We want people to feel welcome. We, don't, we want them to feel like this is a comfortable place, okay? So creating a welcoming culture, 
uh, educating the newcomers. Like we have now, God willing, we have, um, or th thank God, not God willing, but <laughs> we have a bag that we are having like some introductory materials uh, that we give people when they are newcomers. The bag includes like an egbeya and a Bible and a cross and a brochure about the Orthodox Church. And God willing, we'll keep adding more and more things to this. But the idea is that we, we have something that we can give to people so they can begin to understand what we believe. Uh, like I said, making sure the congregation is educated. This is part of the passive evangelism. If we all know what we believe, even though we're not actively preaching, but that in itself is going to make it more conducive for us to feel comfortable to preach and so that when somebody comes to the church and they're standing in the liturgy and someone is standing next to them and that person comes and says, what is Abuna doing? And then you're going to be able to give an answer as opposed to saying, I don't know. You know, because that's something we're frightened of. We don't want to say, I don't know. And also, we, we don't want the person who is coming in to think that we have no idea what we're doing. We're just robots. They're just doing things robotically because that's just how it is. That's not going to be very encouraging for someone like that to join the church. But if we know what we're doing, then when somebody asks us, we'll, we'll have a good answer. Also, the unbelievers require the same healing services like the lost sheep. So if we have counseling services and all these things, then th this is also going to benefit um, this group of people. Also, when people come to join the church, it's good to try to get them involved in some way. You know, put them in some kind of a service, uh, you know, even if it's just community service. Have something for them to do to feel like not only do they feel like the church is welcoming, but the church actually needs me to do something. I feel needed. I feel like there's a job for me to do. There's a function for me to do here. I feel belonging because I'm not just coming as a no-name person who comes on a Sunday and leaves. No, I actually have a role. I have, I have something that I need to do. So these are the three uh, groups we said that a church uh, serves. Church serves the active members, the non-active, and the unbelievers. And for each one, we serve them. Can anyone tell me how we serve the active members? What are the two ways? The active members. How do we serve them? Nourish and and keep. Okay, so we have we nourish them by giving them spiritual food, and we keep them by making sure everything is practical, and by giving fellowship, giving reason to people to want to stay. Okay, what's the second group? Lost sheep. How do we serve them? Search and heal. Okay, good. And then the third group? Unbelievers, and how do we serve them? And what is active? What is the active way we serve the non-believers? Preaching and the passive way? It's on the screen. <laughs> Grafting. Right? Grafting. Because it's, it's like you're taking something who, that is outside like a plant, and you're grafting it in. This is the example that St. Paul uses when he says that the Gentiles are grafted into the vine, okay, which is the church. Right? You have this natural plant that grew up on its own, and you're taking this, this, this something else that's foreign to it, that wasn't, didn't grow up as a part of it, and you're grafting it so it becomes one with the vine, so you can't differentiate between the two. And this is what we're trying to accomplish. You know, like, I think in our church, because we have... You know, for so long, like we have not been very much focused on evangelism, that the fact that there's any non Egyptian person in the church for us, we're like celebrating. Okay? That's not what we're trying to do. Like, that's not the goal. Like, yeah, maybe that's a good first step. But that's not the goal. The goal is, is that this church is full of Americans and that there is more Americans here than Egyptians because this country has much more Americans than Egyptians. So the fact that there's more Egyptians here than Americans means that we're not being very successful. Okay? So our goal, we have to, like, we have to set the right goal. Yeah, maybe we're not going to get there immediately, and maybe we're not going to get there in 50 years. But the goal has to be there. The goal is, if this is an American church, just like any church, just like any church you find, it's not a church that's based on the geographic location of where Egyptians live in the city. It's a church based on there's people living everywhere, and whoever happens to live in a certain area can come and choose to be a member of that church. Okay. And this is what we're trying to, to reach, okay? And in God willing, having these American Coptic churches is the first step to doing that. Um, but it's still, we have a lot of work to do, 
And I think, God willing, having a meeting like this where we can talk about it and talk about different topics and, and have a place where newcomers can come and to learn about the church is, is, is another good step toward that. Any comments or questions? Yes, so Yeah, so I would say this meeting and the Bible study are the best two ways to introduce people to the church. The Bible study is still going to assume some prior knowledge because we're assuming people kind of have basic understanding of the Bible and the things that maybe we have studied recently and so on. So so by all means, invite people to the Bible study, but, but also this meeting is, I think, the, maybe the best way because one, there's more people here than there are at the Bible study, so they'll get a chance to meet more people. And it's on a Sunday. Uh, some of the research has found that when you try to invite people to the church on a day that's not Sunday, it's much less successful. People think of Sunday as the church day. So essentially what we're trying to do with this meeting is to create a church service that people are going to be more familiar with than a liturgy. Liturgy might be something difficult for people to grasp or understand. It might be overwhelming if somebody walks in the door and they see us doing our thing. Um, so, But if they come to this meeting, it's much more recognizable. You have music, at the beginning, you have food. Before that, we actually invite people to come for when we have the food, like after the kids go to Sunday school. Um, and then we have like a sermon. Okay? And so so it's it's that's the intent. That's a good question. Any other comments or questions? Okay, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, God, for this day and for the blessings that you give us. And we thank you, Lord, because you've given us a church that allows us to express the Orthodox faith to those people who live in this country in a way that maybe we have never had the opportunity to do so before. Help us, O oh God, to be faithful, O oh Lord, in our lives and faithful, O oh Lord, to this belief that we have, not only in reading or understanding or attending the liturgy, but living it out, O oh Lord, in our day-to-day -day lives. Grant us, O God, to be bold and not to be afraid of reaching out to those people who are in the world and to proclaim our faith without fear and inviting them to come to the church, not thinking that there would be no possible way they could accept it, but instead believing that your Holy Spirit can work in them and cause them to accept, O Lord, and to understand the deep and spiritual truths that are found here, O Lord, in this place and in this faith. Grant us, O Lord, a joy in our faith and grant us to love you and grant us to serve you, O Lord, with a full heart. Through the prayers of St. Mary, Archangel Michael, St. Paul, St. Mark, and all your saints, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of the only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, and the communion and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.